All right, so it's 9.02, so I'll go ahead and get started and other people can join as they can. So thank you so much for everyone for joining me for this Grand Rounds presentation today. I'm really excited about it. My name is Ada Gu and I'm a PGY3 in the CCFPEM program. And my supervisor for this Grand Rounds presentation was Dr. Kang Ray Lin, uh, who also is a graduate at the CCFPEM program. And the topic today is advanced focus applications with a focus on obstetrics and gynecology. And I would like to particularly acknowledge Dr. Carol King, who is an OBGYN here at London Health Sciences Center for her input and her expert opinion as well. And so we're gonna start with a case presentation and I'll ask people to answer some questions for me as well throughout the presentation. So we saw a 34 year old G1P1 female in the emergency department. Her last menstrual period was in June, 2020 and she was sexually active and attempting to conceive. She had had a few day history of intermittent spotting, sudden onset severe suprapubic pain in the morning after going to the bathroom. And she had this new bright red vaginal bleeding that she thought was a start of her period. And so at this point, what further questions would you like to ask to get some more information? And uh, anyone can just unmute themselves and shout out the answer. Or I'm gonna ask Jen. Jen, what, what else would you like to ask? Sorry, so um, I was just trying to unmute myself. In terms of what I would ask, I would ask about a uh, like a more specific past medical history. I would ask if this has ever happened before. Um, I would ask about some of the medications that she's taking, like the you know um, allergies and things like that, surgeries. Um, and I would kind of start with that. I would probably also ask um, ask about other associated symptoms such as like urinary symptoms. Um, I would ask about um, some generalized symptoms like fevers and, and go from there. Yeah, absolutely. And so we asked those questions. So in terms of her past obstetrical history, she had had a previous spontaneous vaginal delivery at term in 2016. Um, she hadn't used any like fertility drugs or uh, intrauterine um, uh, fertility medications or anything like that. Uh, no past medical history, no medications that she was on, immunizations were up to date, uh, no allergies, and she denied any history of smoking, alcohol, or recreational drug use. And so on the initial physical exam, she came in, she was afebrile, she was hemodynamically stable, and she appeared to be well. And pain was tolerable with some Ketorolac as well as some Tylenol at home. Um, the abdomen was soft, non-distended. She had some left lower quadrant and suprapubic tenderness on palpation, but definitely didn't have any guarding or rebound tenderness, no masses were felt, and didn't have any signs of peritonitis. And so at this point with this information in the physical exam, what would be your differential diagnosis? Ectopic pregnancy is the first uh, thing we need to consider and rule out, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, are there any other things that you would like to consider? I, I mean, uh, all the gynae stuff, uh, ovarian, uh, cyst, distortion, uh, PID, uh, period, uh, intra-abdominal stuff, appy, that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely right. So, I mean, at this point, yes, we definitely have to rule out acute ectopic pregnancy. Um, but at this point, it's pretty undifferentiated, um, especially given her stability and, you know, all the findings on physical exam and history. And so we still need to rule out things like ovarian torsion, um, things like PID, like you said, to ovarian abscess, could still be urinary. So like Jen said, um, ask about urinary symptoms, could still be a renal calculi, um, could still be something like more uh, intra-abdominal, like an acute appendicitis as well, especially with pain in the left lower quadrant. So it is important to keep a wide differential diagnosis. And so at this point, we did do a bedside ultrasound. And so this is the first one we did in the right upper quadrant. And that day we actually had the POCUS team with us. And so they were able to save some scans and to help us out with this as well. And um, so in the right upper quadrant, you can see that there is a little bit of free fluid there. And this was the left upper quadrant, the initial video. And so you can also see kind of a moderate amount of free fluid there as well. Um, and then we, when we looked in the pelvis, uh, there was this five by five centimeter complex agnexal mass as well. 
And so this is kind of just what I just said. So the free fluid in the right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, small amount of free fluid in the pelvis, and then that complex left agnetzel mass that was five by five, by five centimeters uh, with some internal vascularity as well. So at this point, we did order a formal ultrasound um, and the gynecology service was consulted as well. We had done some blood work, of course, and it was starting to come back. So white blood cell count, hemoglobin, platelets were grossly normal. Beta HCG was 1,238. And this was something that the patient was actually unaware of. Uh, CRP was normal. And uh, on the urinalysis, she had large blood. At this point, she had been in our department for about an hour, an hour and a half or so. She had been stable this whole time but she started complaining of increasing lower abdominal pain. And while awaiting the formal ultrasound, which was supposed to be approximately two hours after she came in, um, the patient had a pre episode and the blood pressure had decreased to systolic 80s to 90s. Um, at this point, we had to resuscitate the patient with some crystalloid fluid, with a blood transfusion, as well as give her more analgesia. And we were actually unable to get her to the formal ultrasound because she had become transiently unstable. We repeated her blood work as well, and we found that her white blood cell count had gone up to 29.4, hemoglobin had dropped to 104, and platelet count was 390. And of course, we repeated her bedside ultrasound scan again, and this is the right upper quadrant. So you can see quite a bit more fluid there. And this was the left upper quadrant, which we found to have quite a significant amount of free fluid there, which is definitely different from the first scan. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about the case for serial POCUS. Of course, all the emergency physicians are probably used to doing multiple POCUS during the clinical course, especially if there's any clinical changes. And particularly, for example, in ATLS, they recommend doing serial Q30 minute uh, serial POCUSes as well. It's a rapid, easy to use, non-invasive adjunct to the physical exam. And it's definitely something we should jump to if we think the patient is becoming unstable or they have any change in their clinical course. Um, there's limited literature available on the utility of serial POCUS, but I think anecdotally, many of us have probably found it to be quite useful. And so now that the patient is hemodynamically unstable, what are the next steps? I won't pick on people again, but essentially we called gynecology again, told them about the situation. They were already involved and the resident had already come down to see the patient. And so we just repeated some of the blood work, did made, made sure the group and screen and everything was done, um, tried to adequately resuscitate the patient and stabilize them as much as possible. And they were taken to the OR as an A case. Um, and again, this is before getting the formal ultrasound as she was too unstable to get that done. After she was taken to the OR, the diagnosis was ruptured ectopic pregnancy. They had removed the uh, ovarian ectopic pregnancy and left ophorectomy, and they had found approximately 700 cc's of intra-abdominal bleed, so what we were seeing on the POCUS there. I wanted to talk a little bit about point of care ultrasound in the emergency department. Um, so diagnostic ultrasound was first kind of used in medicine in the 1940s and emergency physicians started assessing trauma patients in the 1970s and the FAST term was coined in the 1990s and incorporated into ATLS. So it's something that emergency physicians have certainly been using for a while. In terms of core POCUS applications, uh, current evidence really supports the integration of POCUS for a variety of different tasks, including resuscitation, diagnostic, procedural guidance, as well as therapeutic monitoring. So we'll often use it for EFAS, AAA scanning, first trimester IUP, thoracic ultrasound, um, cardiac ultrasound, as well as ultrasound guided vascular access. And to really touch quickly on the FAST scan, so of course it's an adjunct to the primary survey. There's four areas that we scan, so the pericardial sac, the hepatorenal fossa, splenorenal fossa, as well as the pelvis or the pouch of Douglas. And um, it's highly sensitive for detection of more than 100 cubic centimeters of intra-abdominal fluid. And as you can see, although the sensitivity, specificity, and negative predictive values do have a range uh, in literature, they are it is quite sensitive specific and has a high negative predictive value. And again, it, it recommends doing serial exams every 30 minutes or so, particularly for patients who have changes in their clinical course. And so what about point of care ultrasound in the emergency department for obstetrics and gynecology? So as we know from literature that POCUS is highly specific for detection of IUP or intrauterine pregnancy. 
And the benefits of using POCUS include reduced frequency of missed ectopic pregnancies. There can be decreased time to surgery. It can shorten length of stay and may also be more cost effective, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and so because it is highly specific for identification of intrauterine pregnancy, a lot of patients may be safely discharged from the emergency department uh, without patient follow-up. And certainly we're lucky to have EPAU here in London. One study that I looked at, so emergency physician ultrasonography for evaluating patients at risk for atopic pregnancy was a meta-analysis. They looked at Medline and Embase and included 10 studies. Um, they had in total 2,057 patients and 152 of them had atopic pregnancy. So in this meta-analysis, the sensitivity was defined as the proportion of patients with ectopic pregnancy for which ED ultrasonography demonstrated no intrauterine pregnancy. And they found that the pool sensitivity was 99.3%, negative predictive value was 99.96%, and negative likelihood ratio was 0.08%. And so what they found was that the visualization of intrauterine pregnancy by emergency physicians was generally sufficient to rule out ectopic pregnancy. And of course, it showed that POCUS provides excellent sensitivity as well as negative predictive value in these situations. Another study that I looked at was, do emergency physicians save time when they're locating a live intrauterine pregnancy with bedside ultrasonography? And this was a retrospective chart review. It was done in an urban community emergency department with a residency program. And in total, they had 270 patients which were scanned by emergency physicians, physicians only, and 1,142 patients who were scanned by radiology only. And so any patient who was scanned by an emergency physician and was then scanned by radiology counted as emergency physician patients. And so intrauterine pregnancy was confirmed by emergency physicians, a median time 59 minutes less than radiology. So the length of stay ended up being 21% less or 59 minutes less when the emergency physician scanned them and they were able to identify that live intrauterine pregnancy. And the length of stay like changed even more for patients who came in in the evening or at nighttime and the length of stay actually decreased by 28% instead. So to touch on first trimester pregnancy, as we know, it's between day one to week 12. Beta HCG concentration doubles approximately every 48 hours within the first 30 days, and a slower rise may indicate an abnormal pregnancy. The concentration of beta HCG peaks around eight to 10 weeks, and the diagnosis of pregnancy is usually made by beta HCG in blood or urine. So as we know, the serum pregnancy test can detect beta HCG levels earlier than urine. Pregnancy by ultrasound, so preferably by transvaginal ultrasound, and fetal cardiac activity by Doppler ultrasound. And although in the literature it's documented that transvaginal ultrasound can pick up uh, pregnancy as with beta HCG as low as 1500, current literature actually supports using a beta HCG more between 2000 to 3000, especially before seven weeks of gestation. And on transvaginal ultrasound, the landmarks are fairly um, they're fairly constant. And so the, the, the gestational sac is usually seen at five weeks. The yolk sac is usually seen at five and a half weeks. The embryo is seen at six weeks, and cardiac activity is usually seen between five to six weeks. And so what about ectopic pregnancy? As we know, it's an extrauterine pregnancy. The most common location is the fallopian tube. So 96% of ectopic pregnancies will be located in the fallopian tube, but it can also be located cervically, interstitially, uh, in the hysterotomy scar, intramurally, ovarian, or abdominal. And in very, very rare cases, of course, a multiple gestation can be heterotopic. So that means it can be intrauterine as well as extrauterine. And the diagnosis is usually made by serum beta ECG as well as transvaginal ultrasound. In terms of ectopic pregnancy risk factors, so I, I looked at a couple of meta-analysis and studies back from the 1990s, and they had stated that previous tubal surgery had an odds ratio of 21. And of course, an odds ratio greater than one indicates that that exposure is associated with a higher odds of outcome. Uh, previous ectopic pregnancy odds ratio is 8.3. In utero diethyl silvestro exposure, odds ratio is 5.6. Previous genital infections, uh, odds ratio is 2.4 to 3.7. Infertility, um, current smoking, as well as IUD use all had increased odds ratios. 
In terms of clinical presentation of ectopic pregnancy, it's first trimester vaginal bleeding and or abdominal pain. There can be a varying volume of bleed and the pain can either be localized or it can be diffuse. Um, of course, patients can also be asymptomatic and usually symptoms will appear between six to eight weeks after the patient's uh, last menstrual period. A rupture can result in life-threatening hemorrhage, and as we know, symptoms of rupture include severe or persistent vaginal pain, presyncope or syncope, similar to the ones that our patient in this case experienced. And I think something to be cognizant of is that vaginal bleeding associated with ectopic pregnancy often happens after a period of amenorrhea. And so what that means is that some women may misinterpret their bleeding as their regular period. And this is particularly true for women who have irregular menses or who do not keep track of their menstrual cycle. So women who also aren't intending to become pregnant. So this is adapted from the American Family Physician back in 2005, and it was looking at ectopic pregnancy risk. So they stated that if the presentation was peritoneal irritation or cervical motion tenderness, the risk group was high. If there was no fetal heart tones and no tissue at the cervical os with pain present, the risk group was intermediate. And if there were fetal heart tones or tissue at the cervical os and no pain, the risk group was low. And this is based on a low prevalence of overall ectopic pregnancy in the emergency department. A more recent, um, a more recent study looked at transvaginal ultrasound findings. Uh, for ectopic pregnancy. And so obviously ectopic cardiac activity has a likelihood ratio of 100, so it's diagnostic. Um, a likelihood ratio greater than five is moderately strong evidence for ectopic pregnancy. Greater than 10 is strong evidence for ectopic pregnancy. And less than 0 0.1 is strong evidence against ectopic pregnancy. And so if you have an ectopic gestational sac, your likelihood ratio is 23. An ectopic mass and fluid in the Patrick Douglas is 4.4. .4. Um, and then ectopic mass has a lower likelihood ratio. Um, and of course, no intrauterine gestational sac can be pretty ambivalent. Um, and then as we said, intrauterine gestational sac obviously uh, basically rules out ectopic pregnancy except in those heterotopic situations. And so this is uh, more recent from the SOGC clinical practice guideline and the ultrasound evaluation of first trimester complications of pregnancy. And so they were looking at the diagnosis of asymptomatic tubal ectopic pregnancy. And what they stated was that possible ectopic pregnancy is when serum beta HCG levels are greater than 2000 and you have the absence of intrauterine pregnancy on transvaginal ultrasound. So it's possible, um, but there could be other situations that would explain these findings. A probable ectopic pregnancy would be when serum beta HCG levels are greater than 2000 and you have absence of intrauterine pregnancy on transvaginal ultrasound and an agnuxal mass on transvaginal ultrasound. So that increases the risk of ectopic pregnancy. And the diagnosis would be if you had a gestational sac inside the fallopian tube on transvaginal ultrasound. So in the absence of an intrauterine pregnancy, a beta HCG level of greater than 2,500 has an 11% sensitivity and 95% specificity for an ectopic pregnancy. And another study that I looked at, just looking at new diagnostic criteria for non-viable pregnancy early in the first trimester. So this was a systematic review article that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine back in 2013 um, by uh, radiologists. And so they really looked at research in the past two to three years, which has shown that the previously accepted criteria for ruling out viable pregnancy, which was mostly based on smaller number of patients, was not stringent enough to avoid false positive resu results for non-viability. And obviously, if you have false positive results, that can greatly impact a woman's course or a patient's course. And um, they suggest that the criteria for diagnosing non-viability in early pregnancy should virtually eliminate false positive results as the sequence of, event, of, of events on early pregnancy on ultrasound are fairly predictable. And so what they recommend uh, are findings diagnostic of pregnancy failure or non-viable pregnancy on transvaginal ultrasound include crown rump length of greater than or equal to seven millimeters and no heartbeat instead of the previously used five millimeter cutoff, a mean sac diameter of greater than or equal to 25 millimeters and no embryo versus the 15 to 16 millimeter previous cutoff, 
um, as well as the absence of embryo with heartbeat greater than or equal to two weeks after a scan that showed gestational sac without a yolk sac, or absence of embryo with a heartbeat greater than or equal to 11 days after a scan showed a gestational sac with a yolk sac. And so what they stated is that there can often be inter-observer variation between 15 to 20 percent. And then also using the last menstrual period can be a very unreliable landmark as well. And so what they recommend is that if you suspect a non-viable pregnancy and that you don't see necessarily any of these findings, you should wait to provide any sort of intervention and send them for follow-up, do serum beta HCGs, do serial beta HCGs, as well as obtain another transvaginal ultrasound. And all the studies that I've referenced today are available in my references as well if people are interested in checking them out after. And so what about management of ectopic pregnancy from the emergency department? So we broke this down into four different types or groups of patients. The patients that we see who are pregnancy of unknown location, so they might have a positive beta HCG, but we might not be able to see anything on the POCUS or we might not know, you know whether this is an early ectopic or an early intrauterine pregnancy. The stable ectopic pregnancy patients, the borderline or transiently stable patients, um, such as the one that we saw in this case, as well as the quite unstable ectopic pregnancy patients. And we were also able to get some expert opinion on this case as well. So in terms of pregnancy of unknown location, if they're stable, you can refer directly, as we know, to the EPAU for ongoing care. And that's usually when they're less than 12 weeks by last menstrual period. They do need a formal ultrasound. So that can either be done by the emergency department, or it can also be arranged by EPAU. And they do not need to consult gynecology if they're stable. Of course, if you have any questions about the patient, um, if you are unsure about how to refer them, or if you're unsure about the management that they require, you can always call gynecology on call and they're happy to help. And you know, certainly they're very willing to work with us. Um, sometimes they can even expedite or they can facilitate an appointment in EPAU as well. And this is also supported by the National Institute for a Health and Care Excellence Guideline, which was published back in 2019, um, who suggests reference or referral to an early pregnancy assessment service uh, if there are less than six weeks gestation, if there's any uncertainty about gestation, or if there's any kind of abdominal pain or bleeding as well. For the stable patient, uh, they recommend consulting gynecology on call as well as arranging a formal ultrasound. And certainly this is for any patient who has a positive pregnancy test and possible pain or abdominal tenderness um, or pelvic tenderness as well. For your borderline or transiently stable patients, definitely consult gynecology as soon as possible. Arrange a formal ultrasound as soon as possible. So during the time that they are stable, if you're able to get that ultrasound, that information can really help gynecology, especially to better characterize a corpus luteum cyst or something else that might be causing the issue. Um, you should get your blood work stats. So that includes obviously a CBC, a group and screen, and make sure they have an IV, IV and keep them MPO because likely they'll be going to OR if they're unstable. Um, and any, resuscita any resuscitative measures that they might need. So that's including any crystalloid fluid, any blood, any analgesia, and just making sure to reassess them frequently and make sure that they're not becoming unstable and they're not declining in clinical course. For your unstable patients, of course, you should immediately consult gynecology. You should do stat blood work, so your CBC, your group and screen. You should call for blood and consider transfusing if they're unstable and also perform other resuscitative measures. So we had talked to uh, Dr. King, and of course, if a patient is unstable, they could not go to a formal ultrasound. Um, so the combination of a positive beta HCG, a negative intrauterine pregnancy, um, and a positive FAST scan would be enough to take them to the operating room. And even if it's not for an ophorectomy or removal, um, they could even go for a diagnostic laparoscopy. And for patients who are seen in a rural or community hospital, of course, it really depends on your center. So any unstable patient, ectopic or intrauterine pregnancy should be consulted to gynecology on call. Of course, if you're in a rural or community hospital and you don't have access to these services, you can potentially consult your general surgery colleagues. 
Um, or you should make the call out as soon as possible through one number and get some sort of other consulting gynecology on board. Uh, of course, a formal ultrasound is always helpful for these situations, but it's understandable if due to time or limitations of resources that you're unable to get it. And a bedside ultrasound is always useful for assessing for hemoperitoneum, for any agnexal masses, as well as any intrauterine pregnancy. And all of these things can provide our colleagues with more information so that they're better able to take care of the patient once transferred. In terms of the patient in our case, um, she had a two-week gynecology follow-up post-operatively. She was admitted only for a couple days and she was discharged home in stable condition. She had five days of light bleeding post-operatively that then subsided and she was feeling well, her incisions had healed um, and she was doing well overall. The twist from this case was that when the pathology formally actually came back, the hemoperitoneum was actually secondary to a ruptured corpus luteal cyst, which actually didn't have any products of conception in it. Um, and her serial beta ECGs were 12 and 2, which meant that uh, things were resolving. So it's possible that she had a very early intrauterine pregnancy that was not actually visualized by bedside ultrasound, and she also had this complex corpus luteum cyst with abundant blood clots. In terms of her follow-up, she is still able to conceive with one ovary, so that was uh, told to her. She should continue to track her menstrual cycles. Um, she had a gynecology follow-up in clinic in a few months. And if pregnancy was suspected, she was recommended to do a home pregnancy test and then call the gynecologist's office where they would do serial beta HCGs as well as a transvaginal ultrasound. Something that we had wondered in this case is that uh, if anything could have been done differently from the emergency department, from the time that she came to see us and we started doing all that work up on her to the time that she went to the operating room. And so something that would have been helpful was a formal ultrasound. So that probably could have better characterized the agnexal mass. Um, and you could have seen whether it actually looked like a corpus luteum cyst versus something else. Um, but ultimately, if a patient becomes unstable or they're quite transiently unstable, then they wouldn't be able to go to ultrasound and likely they would be taken to the OR as long as all of the blood work had been done, as long as they had the IV and were kept NPO as well. And of course, we had talked about uh, heterotopic pregnancy, and um, that's also quite rare. Um, and in this case, it being a corpus luteum cyst that ruptured is also a quite rare case as well. In summary, so we looked at POCUS for the emergency department and then for specifically obstetrics and gynecology. We reviewed some of the literature that looked at uh, emergency physicians using POCUS in first trimester ultrasound, uh, as well as formal ultrasound in first trimester pregnancy and ectopic situations. We looked at ectopic pregnancy in terms of clinical signs and symptoms and ultrasound findings, the management in the emergency department of different types of patients, everything from pregnancy of unknown location to the unstable ectopic pregnancy patient, and talked a little bit about the differences in management between community and academic or urban practice. And so thank you so much to everyone for listening to my presentation today. Um, I'm happy to take any questions now. And again, thank you to Dr. Carol King for providing her expert opinion on this case, as well as even attending this Grand Runs presentation today. I have a question actually. Good job, Ada, that was wonderful. A great case, um, challenging case from our standpoint. Um, from the standpoint of POCUS, like I definitely see great value in it, especially in these unstable patients, really helps us determine, you know, are we seeing intra-abdominal bleeding and um, really helps us expedite and get to the OR as we, you know, determine that's what's necessary for the patient. Um, are the POCUS scans, you know, are they stored on the patient chart? Are they formally documented in any way? Because generally, you know, what I see in our documentation is, you know, based on the POCUS scan by eMERGE, but is there some sort of formalization or even mm -hmm. backtracking um, to the patient's record to be able to get access to the scans or even a report on the scans? Yeah, so all the patient scans are saved in QPath. 
Um, and especially as residents, we're encouraged to save all of our scans and all the staff uh, have to save their scans as well. I don't know if other services have access to QPath, but it's a database for all the scans that are done. And you can look up patients by their ID um, and it'll pull up all the scans that were done on different days. Um, in yeah. terms of other... Oh, Ada, it's Frank here. Yeah, so I'll, I'll pipe in on that question. Um, so, hi, Carol. Um, hey, uh, so the POCA scans are on the, like a new archiving uh, platform for cl uh, cloud-based that anybody can access, though the Guiney residents aren't probably online there yet because we've had to set up accounts. Uh, so like medicine, uh, ICU, uh, Emerge, uh, GenSurge, uh, urology, a lot of them are coming online there. So if that's a, if that's a desire and want, uh, that is certainly a uh, next step that we can do for all the residents and staff. Um, the that's connected that way. It's not formally pushed to the uh, EMR just yet. Um, there is capacity for that uh, really until we go to electronic charting for staff. I don't think that's going to be a, a mainstay, but certainly in any consultation, the gynae residents should have the ability to ask, uh, hey, uh, what's the pin? I'll look it up and they can uh, look that up for sure online. So I wonder too, from the documentation standpoint, if like a formal, even a written or some sort of documentation of the fast scan, like I don't know if you guys have a form that is attached to the patient's chart or whatnot that helps document it in terms of even just your assessment and impression from the, um, because, you know, every gynae resident may not be comfortable reading your POCUS or your FAST scans, for instance, I don't know, but um, having some sort of formal document on the chart, just even for us to look back on, for instance, if we were to be reviewing the case to be able to say, okay, this is what the POCUS team thought, and this was their general impression, um, and that it's formally documented some way. You got the old uh, doc chicken scratch that usually is what uh, goes along with that, which which can be good. Like, yeah, I think a lot of us do our best, um, but I'm not going to pretend that some uh, of us have the worst handwriting ever. So uh, that's probably the main uh, the main one that you can do now, but it doesn't mean that we can't do a little bit better. So we can we can certainly kind of take some steps to formalize that and especially these patients. Uh, in the guiding ones. Especially these patients, if we're going to act upon the scan based on the scan, it's nice from our standpoint too, I think, to say, oh yeah, this was the the impression. And, you know, because I think even looking at that scan, those are beautiful scans. It's, it's you know, guys are doing a great job with that. So thank you. Uh, if we can use, you know, use that, especially in this case, for instance, you know, she didn't have time to get a formal scan. We took her right to the OR. Um, so yeah, it just would be helpful, I think. Um, yeah, nice to see. Uh, I agree with you. Uh, we'll try and uh, improve a little bit on that. But for the most part, these ones usually get uh, pretty well documented, at least in the formal stage. Uh, and that's my and that's my plug to the rest of the residents and staff on this call to always save your scans. Thank you. Oh, and it's uh, Jason Lam here. Um, the other thing is for the EPAU clinic referral, they do have a heading that says POCUS findings, where we'll write down our uh, POCUS findings, whether we've done a trans abdominal plus or minus the transvaginal, so we can show uh, if we saw a GS, YS, uh, heart rate, uh, et cetera. Um, and then, as Frank was saying, there is some capacity to push these reports to Cerner. So for this one specifically, this is the scan that I did, and we were able to um, push that report to uh, under results, so she focus fast or focus abdomen. Yeah, happy to work with you on that, Carol, uh, and come up with uh, something that maybe can be a bit more overt, especially as, uh, as uh, we want to improve the trust with the uh, gynae department, uh, and especially as we refer more to uh, the EPAU. So I, I think there is some ability we can do a little bit better on the OB side of things, uh, but I would say most staff, if they have a positive fast, at least on, on the physical chart, probably write, you know, plus plus free fluid, plus IUP, or plus query ectopic. Usually there's some uh, notation on the chart about that. Absolutely. And certainly when we document, you know, for instance, this case, it was a, you know, based on the POCUS scan, you know, we saw a significant free fluid and you're, you're right. And Ada went through it, you know, that amount of free fluid at nexal mass, it's an atopic and ruptured atopic until proven otherwise. So I think the twist on this case, which I think as a gynecologist, your heart kind of stinks a bit when you see the pathology come back showing that it was not, uh, you know, there's no gestational tissue, but in the end, the ovary needed to come out. It was what was bleeding, and that one need, what was what needed to happen from the patient stability, um, life saving piece of things. Because even in the operating room, she was actually quite unstable. They had two IVs running wide. Uh, we were 
transfusing blood. So, um, and she had probably one of the most significant um, hemoperitoneums I've seen. Um, so it was quite significant and it's amazing how much in this, I think, case really shows how much a, a young, healthy woman, how much they can go through and, um, you know, how much their own hemodynamics can support them until they just suddenly crash. And so she, it was quite impressive how much blood she had in her abdomen. So the ovary needed to come out regardless, but it's, you know, the question of after the fact, in hindsight, was there a very early intrauterine pregnancy, which complicates factors as her beta was quite low, 1200. So even a transvaginal ultrasound might not have seen that. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was actually crazy when she came in. She's like, I almost didn't come in, but I just like the Tylenol just wasn't enough for my pain. And I figured I would come in for some pain medication. So you're totally right. Like it's, it's always surprising to see how much young, healthy patients can tolerate. Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> it, I just had a quick question about uh, the slide you had about uh, follow up for unknown pregnancy location based off numbers alone. Um, mm -hmm. Can you, were, I was a little bit confused there. So are you saying that anybody with uh, a certain data of around 2,500 uh, plus a pregnancy needs a formal ultrasound? Is that what you're trying to imply there? Or I was a little bit unclear on that. Uh, do you mean, for the the study that I was talking about, or oh, the slide, the diagnosis uh, that the diagnosis of asymptomatic tubal ectopic pregnancy. You had a slide that said EPA referral formal mm -hmm. ultrasound. Um, I think for pregnancy unknown location. I just wanted to oh, clarify because yeah. I because this is something I can sometimes rage against about what we uh, refer to EPAU and mm -hmm. you know who gets you know what because I numbers to me matter not as much i think the range in the discriminatory zones when it comes to beta is all over the place and i think a lot of staff yeah. can attest uh, the range that they've seen so i think it's important for the the residents and learners on this line to understand you know when someone comes in with a, a certain beta i mean clinical context is important of you know pain is obviously a bit of a different monster but if they just got mm -hmm. a beta and a little bit of spotting you know what what the next steps for every patient should be just to clarify yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, what I meant was that if they have a positive beta and you don't know what's happening, they should get a formal ultrasound at some point. Um, so it may not be from the emergency department, but EPAU can also arrange a formal ultrasound to be done. But if they are having pain and, you know, active bleeding, then I, I would do a formal ultrasound for that patient. So, so you're saying anybody with a positive beta, you're mm -hmm. going to send to EPAU and get a formal ultrasound on? So, so yeah, that's what I, that's what I'm saying. I think I would, sorry, the time, sorry, I, I was distracted there for a second, but I think um, if it's a very low beta and they're otherwise, you know, just a bit of spotting and nothing that you're worried about an ectopic, for instance, because ectopics can, you can see it with any beta. Um, I think it's reasonable to send them to EPAU with follow-up. Um, may not necessarily need a formal scan because at a beta of let's say 700 you're not going to see anything now of course if you had significant pain then you'd be wanting to do a scan to roll out at a mass so hopefully that's and then they could what they would do with epau is they would do a serial beta then they would do their transvaginal ultra, how epau set up is they do the transvaginal ultrasounds in the clinic can do the betas and if it does end up being an ectopic they can also do the medical management through bau um, or arrange for surgical management through gyne on call. For sure. I, I guess my, I'm thinking of the patient, what you're describing with is like has a beta of say 800 and they're there and they're like, oh, I didn't know I was pregnant. And they're not really having any pain or bleeding or anything specifically at that moment. Um, so I, I, I guess I wonder, is there any particular reason why they can't follow up with their family doc for just kind of repeat betas? Uh, and go from there like or is really the standard going to be that we refer all these to EPAU because that, that's actually quite a number of patients that we see currently oh gosh no those I think family doc is fine I think EPAU would be if they have spotting pain like symptoms um, where there could be complications of the early pregnancy I think if it's a hey I showed up because I had I don't know some other reason they're there and turns out they're pregnant I think it's reasonable to send them to um, their family doctor for, for follow-up just for routine pregnancy care perfect
If there are no further questions, I, I guess that's the end of the Grand Rounds presentation today. Um, so thank you again to Dr. Carol King for coming and answering some questions um, and providing your expert opinion. And thank you everyone else for joining the Grand Rounds presentation today. I hope it was helpful. Of course, if anyone is interested in any of the resources I used, used or any of the literature, I'm happy to share those things with you or even send you my slides if that's allowed. Um, otherwise, I think this is recorded if you wanted to watch it again on your own time. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Good job.